Hello everyone. Today we are going to be discussing chapter 15, the atmosphere, and specifically we're going to be looking at chapter 15.1, Earth's atmosphere. Our guiding question for this topic is how can we describe Earth's atmosphere? And the knowledge skills that we're going to be looking at here are we should be able to describe the properties of the atmosphere, identify the four main layers of the atmosphere, and also explain heat transfer and the interaction of air masses in the troposphere. So, of course, like we start off more, most of our classes, I would like you to go ahead and uh, pause the video right here for vocab and go ahead and write this, the definitions in your workbook. And when you are ready, uh, we'll continue on with lecture. So, lesson 15.1, Earth's atmosphere. The air we breathe and all the weather we see is contained in the lowest 1% of the Earth's atmosphere. Let's start by talking about when people watch the news or the weather report on TV, what information do you think they're most interested in? Chances are they want to know whether the weather is cloudy or sunny, whether it is likely to rain, or what the air temperature is. Most people also probably pay close attention to the forecast for the weather tomorrow or the next few days. Any weather report, whether you watch it on TV, hear it on the radio, read it in the newspaper, or check it on the internet, has the same function. A weather report is going to describe the conditions of Earth's atmosphere. Here I've inserted an image of the sunset seen from the International Space Station where we can see some of the layers of the Earth's atmosphere extending out into outer space and ultimately into a vacuum. But before we jump into that, we're going to start with the properties of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is the thin layer of gases that surrounds the Earth. To get an idea of the size of the atmosphere, imagine that the Earth were the size of an apple. You breathe on the apple and a film of water forms on its surface. Compared to the apple, that film of water is very thin. The atmosphere is about that thin compared to the size of the Earth. We live at the bottom of the atmosphere, which provides us with oxygen, protects us from most harmful rays of sunlight, and transports and recycles water. It also burns up incoming meteors and helps control climate. To understand the atmosphere, you need to know its composition. Humidity, temperature, and air pressure are also important properties of the atmosphere. Composition of the atmosphere. You may be surprised to learn that the air you breathe in is made up mostly of nitrogen and not oxygen. The atmosphere consists of roughly 78% nitrogen gas and 21% oxygen gas. The remaining 1% is composed of several other gases as shown in this figure, figure one. Air also contains water vapor, which is water in the form of gas. Let's talk a little bit about nitrogen. In the atmosphere, nitrogen gas occurs as a molecule with the chemical formula of N2. This chemical formula indicates that a molecule of nitrogen gas consists of two nitrogen atoms. All organisms or living things contain nitrogen. However, only certain kinds of bacteria can use nitrogen in the form in which it occurs in the atmosphere. These bacteria take nitrogen in and convert it to a chemical compound in the process called nitrogen fixation. 
These chemicals then become available for other organisms to use. Next, oxygen makes up only about one-fifth of the atmosphere. The most common form of oxygen is in the atmosphere occurs as a molecule having the chemical formula O2. Therefore, most molecules of oxygen are made up of two atoms of oxygen. Most living things cannot survive without oxygen. In addition, oxygen is necessary for combustion or burning. During combustion, oxygen combines chemically with a fuel, such as gasoline, wood, or paper. The products of combustion are carbon dioxide and water. Over Earth's long history, the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere has changed. The atmosphere of early Earth contained almost no oxygen. The only atmosphere was mostly made up of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, carbon monoxide, and water vapor. Oxygen has been a buildup with tiny photosynthetic micro microorganisms first appeared. These microorganisms produced oxygen during photosynthesis and released it into the atmosphere. Now water vapor. Air contains water vapor. The chemical formula for water, whether it is solid, liquid, or gas, is always H2O, indicating that water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. In addition to water vapor, you will find trace amounts of other gases, such as argon, carbon dioxide, neon, helium, krypton, and hydrogen. Go ahead and take a few minutes to answer question one in your workbook for section 15.1. Humidity. Humidity is how much water vapor is in the atmosphere. Condensation is when water vapor becomes liquid water or ice. And cloud formation is when water binds to and condenses around tiny particles, including salt crystals, smoke, and dust. Evaporation, condensation, and precipitation are the key factors in our water cycle that can that affect humidity. But what we want to talk about is relative humidity. Relative humidity Air does not always hold the same amount of water. Relative humidity is the ratio of water vapor the air contains to the maximum amount that it could at that particular temperature. Average daytime relative humidity in Phoenix, Arizona is only 31%. This means that in general, the air in Phoenix contains less than a third of the water vapor that it could contain. In contrast, on the tropical island of Guam, the relative humidity rarely drops below 88%. On some hot days, you may have heard people complaining about the humidity. People are sensitive to changes in relative humidity because perspiration cools our bodies. When humid humidity is high, sweat does not readily evaporate and the body cannot cool itself efficiently. We're gonna talk about condensation. In general, warm air can hold more water vapor than cooler air. Suppose warm air contains all the water vapor it can hold, and then the air cools down. When this happens, the water vapor becomes liquid water or ice is called condensation. If the temperature is above freezing, water droplets form. Ice crystals form when the temperature is below freezing. Dew and frost are both examples of condensation. Go ahead and take a look at question two in your workbook. Next, we're gonna look at cloud formation. 
In order for condensation to occur, there must be a surface on which the water vapor can condense. Dew and frost, for example, form on surfaces such as the blades of grass or flower petals, as shown in figure three on the previous slide. Like dew and frost, clouds are a result of condensation. During the formation of clouds, water vapor condenses on tiny particles in the air. These particles include salt crystals, smoke, and dust. And in the image, you will see several different examples of different cloud types. Air temperature. Like the air's water content, the temperature of the air also varies from place to place and from time to time. Temperature varies over Earth's surface because the sun's rays strike some areas more directly than others. In the next chapter, we're going to learn more about factors that affect air temperature. Air pressure. Air is made up of individual molecules of nitrogen and other gases. Each molecule, tiny as it is, weighs something. The weight of the column of air that pushes down on the earth beneath it. The way the weight of your body pushes down on the ground that you stand on. The force with which something pushes on an area is called pressure. And air pressure or atmospheric pressure is the force exerted by air on the air below it. We have the ability to measure air pressure. A barometer is an instrument that measures air pressure. There are two common types of barometers, a mercury and an aneroid. In a mercury barometer, which is shown in the figure on your slide, air pressure pushes a column of mercury upwards in a tube. The greater the air pressure, the higher the mercury rises. When a mercury barometer is used, air pressure is usually expressed in inches because the height of the mercury column in the barometer is measured in inches. An aneroid barometer has a metal chamber whose walls bend inward when air pressure is high. The walls bulge out when air pressure is low. The bending of the chamber walls moves a dial and the dial indicates the changing of air pressure. In an aneroid barometer, air pressure is expressed in units called millibars. Altitude and pressure. In general, the lower the altitude or height above sea level, the higher the air pressure. To understand why this is true, think about a stack of books. The one on the bottom of the pile is under the most pressure because it's bearing the weight of all of the books above it. Similarly, the air at the bottom of the column of air is under greater pressure than the air higher up. Air pressure at sea level is about 1,000 millibars. In contrast, at the top of Mount Everest, air pressure is just over 300 millibars. Go ahead and take a look at number four in your workbook. Next, we're going to discuss layers of the atmosphere. Key concept is the main layers of the atmosphere are the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. Earth's atmosphere is divided into these four main layers, primarily on the basis of changes in temperature. The layers of the atmosphere, again, are troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. Let's discuss the troposphere. The lowest layer of the atmosphere, the one directly above the ground, is called the troposphere. The troposphere blankets Earth's surface and contains the oxygen we need to live. The movement of air within the troposphere is also largely responsible for Earth's weather. Almost all clouds are found in the troposphere. The troposphere contains three quarters of the atmosphere's mass, even though it is thin compared to the Earth's, the atmosphere's other layers. The troposphere averages about 11 kilometers in height. 
At the poles, it is about seven kilometers high. And at the equator, it is about 18 kilometers high. Temperature in the troposphere. Within the troposphere, the higher the air is above Earth, the cooler it becomes. On average, tropospheric air temperature goes down by about 6.5 degrees Celsius for each kilometer in altitude. The top of the troposphere. At the top boundary of the troposphere, the temperature starts going down. A layer at the top of the troposphere acts like a cap, limiting mixing between the troposphere and the atmospheric layer above it, which is the stratosphere. The stratosphere is a layer of the atmosphere above the troposphere, as seen in your figure on your slide. The stratosphere extends 11 to 50 kilometers above the sea level. The gases in the stratosphere do not mix much. Therefore, once substances, including pollutants, enter it, they usually stay there for a very long time. Temperature in the stratosphere. Unlike the troposphere, the highest part of the stratosphere is warmer than lower, at lower levels. However, the tr troposphere, excuse me, however, the stratosphere is definitely not warm. It reaches a maximum temperature of negative three degrees Celsius at its highest altitude. The ozone layer. The most common form of oxygen is O2, but oxygen also occurs as O3, which is a gas called ozone. Ozone is concentrated in a portion of the stratosphere called the ozone layer. The upper stratosphere is warmer than the lower stratosphere because ozone gas absorbs and scatters the sun's ultraviolet rays. UV light penetrates the upper stratosphere but most of it fa fails to reach the lower stratosphere. The ozone layer greatly reduces the amount of UV light that reaches Earth's surface. UV light can chain damage the organism's living tissue and can cause harmful changes in its DNA. Therefore, the ozone layer's protective effects are vital for life on Earth. In the stratosphere, ozone occurs naturally and is beneficial to humans because it filters out UV light. However, in the lower levels of the troposphere, ozone does not na naturally occur. In the troposphere, ozone is considered a pollutant. It is harmful to living tissues, including lung tissue, and can interfere with plant growth. Next, we're gonna discuss the mesosphere and the thermosphere. Above the stratosphere lies the mesosphere, the layer that extends 50 to 80 kilometers above sea level. In this layer, temperatures decrease with altitude, reaching their lowest point at the top of the mesosphere. Air pollution is extremely low. Next, the thermosphere is the top layer, which begins about 80 kilometers above Earth's surface and extends upward into space. Air is very thin, and the thermosphere has only a tiny fraction of the atmosphere's mass, and the temperature is very high. Go ahead and take a look at num question number five in your workbook and fill in the chart as I continue to discuss the layers of the atmosphere. So discussing again the troposphere, this is the layer of the atmosphere we live in. It's where most of Earth's weather occurs and where oxygen is located. Above that is the stratosphere, the ozone layer is a part of the stratosphere, which contains O3 and helps absorb and reflect ultraviolet radiation. Next, the mesosphere 
is where chunks of rocks called meteoroids can be burned up as they zoom through the mesosphere, making fiery trails. And the outermost layer, the thermosphere, disturbances in this layer can produce what is known as the aurora borealis, or the northern lights. The aurora borealis is a colorful light display in a very thin layer of atmosphere. Once you have completed filling in table, the table for question number five, go ahead and take a look at question number six. Now we're gonna take a closer look at the troposphere and weather. Processes that affect weather in the troposphere include heat transfer and the interaction of air masses. Weather and climate each involve properties of the troposphere, such as temperature and humidity. Weather refers to atmospheric conditions over a short period of time, typically hours or days, and within relatively small areas. Whereas climate refers to and describes the pattern of atmospheric conditions in a large geographic region over a long period of time. For example, London has a moist temperature climate, but the weather on summer days in London can sometimes be hot, dry, and sunny. We're going to take a look at this slide for heat transfer in the troposphere. Energy from the sun's heat heats the atmosphere. This energy drives air movement in the troposphere and influences weather and climate. Heat always moves from warmer substance to something that is cooler. Heat is transferred in three ways. First, radiation. Next, conduction. And the third, convection which you can see on the images on your slide. This shows how the processes work in the troposphere. Radiation. On a sunny summer day, the handle of a car door becomes hot because the energy from the sun in the form of sunlight. The car door has been heated by radiation, which is the transfer of heat through space. Heat travels from the sun to Earth's atmosphere by radiation. When objects are heated by radiation, there is no direct contact between the heat source and the object it is heating. Dark objects do tend to absorb more radiation than objects of lighter colors, and light colors tend to reflect much of the radiation away, meaning that dark objects will be hotter and light objects will be cooler in relationship. Radiation, conduction, and convection all help to transfer heat in the troposphere. Heat from the sun and heat and the heat that moves from an electric burner to the air are both transferred by radiation. Heat moves from a burner to water in a pan by conduction. Within the water in the pan, heat is transferred by convection currents. So what is conduction? If you touch the heated handle of a car door, you will feel that it is hot. Heat passes from the handle to your hand through conduction. Conduction is the transfer of heat directly between two objects that are in contact with one another. Conduction occurs when molecules collide and the energy is transferred from one molecule to another. In the troposphere, conduction only occurs between Earth's surface and the molecules in the air directly in contact with it. Convection. Fluids include liquids and gases, such as gases in the atmosphere. In fluids, molecules are free to move around. 
Convection is the transfer of heat by the movement of currents within a fluid. Convection is an important method of heat transfer in the troposphere. Convection currents in the movement of heat. The process of convection is related to density. Density is the amount of mass of a substance in a given volume. For example, a brick has greater density than a block of wood of that same volume because there is a greater amount of mass in the brick. When air near the surface of the earth is heated, it becomes less dense than it was before. The cooler air above it is denser than the warmer air at the surface. Because of this difference in density, the cool air sinks and the warm air rises above it. When the cooler air sinks to the ground level, it then picks up heat and begins to rise. Sinking cool air and rising warm air form what we call convection currents. Convection currents cause wind and move heat through the troposphere. Please go ahead and answer number nine in your student workbook. Air masses and fronts. Throughout a large body of air called an air mass, properties such as temperature, pressure, and humidity are similar. Weather can change when air masses with different properties come together. The boundary between the air masses that differ in temperature and moisture is called a front. We have both warm fronts and cold fronts. A warm front is a boundary along which mass of warmer, moister air pushes against a mass of colder air that is dry. Because warm air is less dense than cool air, some of the warm, moist air rises over the cold air mass as shown in your figure, the first figure. The warm air then cools. Because cool air can hold less moisture than warm air can, the water vapor in the cooler air condenses and forms clouds, and light rain may fall. In your second image, we see a cold front. This is a boundary along which a colder, drier air mass pushes against a warmer, moister air mass. Because colder air is denser than warmer air, the cold air tends to wedge beneath the warmer air. The warmer air rises. As the air rises, it cools to form clouds. If the rising air contains a lot of water vapor, heavy precipitation, snow or rain, may fall. If there is little water vapor in the air, the cold front may result in clouds only. Cold fronts can produce sudden weather changes, including thunderstorms. Once a cold front passes through an area, the sky is usually clearer and the temperature and humidity tend to drop. Go ahead and look at number 10 and 11 in your student workbook. Pause the video as you need. Last, we're gonna review the key concepts for the day. First, properties of the atmosphere include its composition, relative humidity, temperature, and air pressure. Next, the main layers of the atmosphere are the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and thermosphere. And lastly, the processes that affect weather in the troposphere include heat transfer and the interaction of air masses.